Hello everyone, I'm Allison Bolander. I'm the career counselor at Mechanicsville High School and I have Eric Allstrand here today from Dartmouth College. Um, so we're gonna let him tell us all the things we need to know about Dartmouth. Eric? Awesome, thanks so much, Allison. Um, I wanna keep this as casual as possible, y'all. Please definitely feel free to use the chat. I definitely would rather get to the questions that y'all have more than anything else. Um, that said, I also wanna give you something to look at other than my face because that's not very interesting. Um, so when I kind of first kind of start with, with something kind of key about Dartmouth is Dartmouth's location is, is really central to who we are. It's a place where, um, you are a little bit more removed. Definitely. If you looked up cliche college town in the dictionary, there'd probably be a picture of Hanover, New Hampshire. It very much is that place, um, right on the border between New Hampshire and Vermont. You're in a place where, um, you're about two hours North of Boston, three hours South of Montreal and about four hours, depending on traffic north of New York City. Um, and it's a place that is it, surrounded by nature in every direction. Um, you are right on the banks of the Connecticut River. Occam Pond is located right at the road. Um, especially this time of year, it is absolutely stunning. Uh, a place where you're definitely going to see the full scope of New England fall. Um, but it's a place where, yes, that connection with the outdoors, whether that be um, heading out on the river, kayaking, canoeing, paddleboarding, whatever, whether that be hiking in the, the White Mountains of New Hampshire or the Green Mountains of, of Vermont, um, or just taking advantage of kind of the natural environment around you. Yes, that's going to be a big thing. Um, but it's not to say that every day of your life at Dartmouth involves, you know, strapping on boots and going for a hike. Um, it's, I think, just as important the tone that that sets in our location sets. It's a place that's just a little bit more relaxed as a result of our location. Um, you can literally and figuratively breathe a little bit easier in Hanover. And I think that makes such a huge difference, especially when partnered with your, your um, academic cadence, which is a little bit faster at Dartmouth. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, you are in a place where um, you have this neat intersection of being a small college, about 4,400 students were the smallest member of the Ivy League. Um, you are in a small town in New Hampshire, you know, technically speaking, for sure. Um, but you also are in a place where, because of Dartmouth, you have the largest hospital north of Boston is the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. You can actually see it in the very back corner of this photo here. Um, so the research that's going to be taking place there, the opportunities for shadowing, for internships are going to be immense, and you're not competing with anyone else for those opportunities. You have at Dartmouth the Hood Art Museum, which is the uh, largest art museum north of Boston, a collection of over 60,000 pieces right outside your door. Also because of Dartmouth and just the, the gravity that it, it brings, a lot of folks are coming to Dartmouth to perform, to give talks, to um, to, to be with, with students. And I really emphasize that point of Dartmouth being a place about the undergraduates. Um, it, it's a place where, yes, we have about 2,000 graduate students. A large chunk of those are business school students who are kind of off doing their own thing. Um, but it is a, a place that is in so many ways a small liberal arts college that got a little too big. And you're going to be, by and large, living on campus all four years, surrounded by people from all 50 states, 97 countries, over 32 indigenous tribes, speaking over 60 different languages, and they're right outside your door. And, and you're gonna learn just as much sitting up at two in the morning, talking to your friends about their ideas, their perspectives, their uh, beliefs and where they're from as you are in class the next day. And I think that element of community is, is so kind of tied to Dartmouth's physical location. Um, our physical location also means that you have seasons. I know that Virginia says it has seasons, but you guys don't have winter. This is what winter looks like, um, where sometimes the snow falls in feet and not inches. You're in a place where um, we do winter, I think, particularly well. This is also the little secret. The best time to live in a place where it snows is when you're in college, because you don't have to do anything. You don't have to scrape off your car. You don't have to shovel the sidewalk. You kind of just get to do the fun stuff. And at Dartmouth, that takes a lot of different forms. Um, it could be, you know, in, in Dartmouth's case, we're one of only two universities that owns a mountain, and we have two of them. Um, so students can head up to the skiway, which is only about 20 minutes up the road. There's a bus that leaves on the hour from the library throughout the winter and brings students up there. Um, one of my favorite things to do is, is to go up to the skiway early in the season, and I get to see all the incredible, brilliant, amazing students that I admitted 
face plant on the bunny slope as they're learning to ski for the first time. Um, but also at Dartmouth, we, we have a lot of traditions around the snow. So whether it be winter carnival, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like, a lot of um, festivities, there's uh, an ice sculpture competition, there's a giant snow sculpture out on the green, there's human dog sled racing and snowshoe races, um, lots of fried stuff, free food, never a bad idea. Um, it might also be the small stuff, like the first big snowball or snow fight of the year is going to be after the first snowfall of the year. Um, you'll get an email from Dr. Seuss, who's a Dartmouth alum, that will invite everyone out to the green at midnight for a snowball fight. So you'll be out there and there'll be hundreds, over a thousand students throwing snowballs at each other. Um, but Dartmouth's on a quarter system, so we're, we're in a little bit of a different arrangement. Fall, winter, spring, and summer terms mean that you're going to see Hanover, New Hampshire in fall, winter, spring, and summer. Um, we don't have the traditional summer break, so you're going to be out on the river, hopping in a kayak or a canoe. You'll be up at the organic farm, kind of getting your hands dirty. Uh, they also have a great uh, pizza oven, would, would recommend. Um, but the quarter system is, is really central to the, the structure of Dartmouth and the cadence of Dartmouth. So at, at Dartmouth, you're only taking three classes at a time. That's it. Which probably sounds like a joke. You're like, I could do that in my sleep. Um, you're taking three classes and covering an entire course worth of material in 10 weeks. So it's definitely fast. Um, you definitely move through a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time, but you also dive really deeply into those subject areas. You're of course, choosing the classes that you're taking more intentionally as well, not to knock high school, but you're probably taking some classes you don't love right now, and that's going to be less so the case at Dartmouth. Um, but there are a lot of things that result as part of that academic structure. As I mentioned, we don't have the traditional summer break, but that still means that you get a break. It just means that you decide when that happens. You have a lot more autonomy over your, your four years at Dartmouth and exactly when you're taking classes on campus, when you're taking classes abroad, when you're doing internships, when you're doing research full time. Um, you might take off, I don't know, winter term one year. That might be your summer break and you go and do an internship in a time of the year when no other college student is competing for an internship. So you're not in the running with every other college student in the United States. Um, you may be working on a really specific research project that, um, I don't know, involves studying glacial melt in Greenland. Well, that takes place in the spring. You can't wait until the summer for that to happen. Go, get that paper ready for publication, commit to that experience. Um, you are, over the course of your four years, going to have just a little bit more ownership over your, your calendar. There are a lot of emergent properties of the quarter system, and I'll, I'll touch on certainly some of them, but happy to answer more questions about it. Um, one kind of key thing is that your classes look a little bit different. If y'all like your classes now where you get to know your faculty really well, where you can joke around with them, where you have a little bit more of a rapport with them, that's going to be much more akin to what classes look like at Dartmouth. Um, that said, I do think it's a double-edged sword. Your faculty oftentimes expect a lot out of you as a result. They know all your strengths and all your weaknesses, and they're not going to be weaknesses at the end of a class at Dartmouth. Um, but you're in a, in, a, in a much smaller academic environment than, than most universities. The average class size at Dartmouth is about 18, but I think a more indicative set of numbers, because averages can be really warped, is that at Dartmouth, our uh, current term has four classes with more than 100 students in them, and about half of our classes have fewer than 20. So your classes might have 10, 20, 30, 40% of the grade as class participation. Yes, you're learning a lot of information in your classes at Dartmouth, but I think more than that, you're learning what to do with information. My phone you know, can like launch the space shuttle. Um, if we just taught you information at, by the end of the four years that you're at Dartmouth, um, it might be obsolete. You're, you're going to be in charge of solving problems and navigating difficulties 20 years from now that we haven't even considered yet. And by being in a smaller academic environment where you're working the muscles of debating concepts, of thinking critically about the information you're consuming, um, bringing in ways of thinking from other academic disciplines and, and letting it influence your framework of thinking, leveraging all of that to solve a problem, kind of working those muscles over and over again in a, in a more um, kind of active academic environment, those are going to be the things that, that serve you regardless of, of what you plan to do after Dartmouth. And again, that, that smaller opportunity to, to really get to know your faculty, to learn as much from your peers in the classroom as anything else is going to be kind of pivotal for that. Um, a big 
additional piece of the quarter system is if you tally up the classes that you take over the course of your four years, even though you're only taking three at a time, you actually typically take more classes than you would on most traditional semester systems. So you're not in a rush to graduate. That means that you can take a class just because it's interesting or because the professor is cool. Um, you can dabble in subject areas you haven't even considered yet. You might take a class in a completely new discipline and say, wow, I love this. I want to study it for the rest of my life. You might take that class and say, that was great. No, thanks. And that's fine. Again, you're not behind because you chose to do that. You are going to see a lot more students studying more than one thing as a result of that. That could be double majors, majors and minors. We also have something called modifications at Dartmouth that I'm happy to talk more about if y'all have questions about it. Um, but a big piece of that is we lead the Ivy League in the number of students we're going to study away. Um, and there are a number of reasons that that's the case, but about 55% of students are going to go abroad once, 30% twice, and 10% three or more times. Um, don't get me wrong, we love students, we want you to be on campus, um, but take this opportunity to explore the world. Uh, at Dartmouth, they, um, the fact that you're taking more classes over the course of your four years me means that even if you want to just study away with a subject area that wasn't related to your own, you can do that. You're not going to be behind because you chose to take that leap. Um, we do have a huge array of study away opportunities, 40 to 50 in a typical year. And it's not just kind of the traditional study aways that are doing that. It could be a, uh, I don't know, an economics trip to Germany. It could be a biology trip to Costa Rica, uh, an astronomy trip to, to South Africa. Um, a lot of different departments will have study away opportunities. And by and large, for most study away trips, you're going with Dartmouth faculty, Dartmouth students, you're taking Dartmouth classes, getting Dartmouth credit, using Dartmouth money. It's uh, a lot more seamless of a process. And I think that's part of why so many more students are going to do it. Um, and, and it's also something that once you do once, you're going to want to probably do again. Um, I also think that regardless of where you go to college, you should definitely study away. Um, that's my own bias there. But again, at Dartmouth, just a little bit more built into the opportunities that, that you have in front of you. Um, but when you are back on campus, and regardless of when you're coming back from abroad or coming back from an internship or coming back from research, whatever that might be, um, you are a part of a house system at Dartmouth. We are a residential community. Everyone is sorted into one of six houses when they arrive at Dartmouth. None of these houses like doom you to a life of evil. None of them, there's no sorting hat involved. Um, but it is the kind of general uh, neighborhood on campus that you're going to live for four years. Um, it's not the exact room or building, but kind of the district on campus. Um, there are a lot of things that happen through the house system, whether it be intramurals or events um, like workshops or speakers or just opportunities to hang out and kind of blow off steam during midterms. Um, but it is this nice kind of uh, launching point for a lot of your experience over your course of your four years. Um, you'll have a house professor who's organizing a lot of those events. Every faculty and staff member at Dartmouth is also sorted into a house. So you'll meet this great kind of cross section of Dartmouth's community because everyone is sorted into a house randomly. Uh, you're going to meet people from all over the world, from around the country, from a lot of different academic disciplines, both faculty and students. And you'll meet them in formal and informal settings and I think have more of an opportunity to get to know them as a result. Um, as I mentioned, upwards of 90% of students at Dartmouth are gonna live on campus all four years. Um, you are part of the Dartmouth community. It's, it's gonna be a place that's much more, um, I think, close knit as a result of that. And, and you're also going to consistently meet new people of the, over the co course of your four years at Dartmouth. You don't come to Dartmouth, uh, you know, make friends your first year and then fall off the face of the earth by moving off campus. You're going to have friends in the classes above you and all the classes below you. Um, it's, I, I think, a place where you are constantly kind of being folded in and, and meeting new people. And um, again, part of that's our location. Part of it, I think, is, is by proxy of the students who come to Dartmouth. I think that there are very few things you can say about every Dartmouth student, but I think that willingness and eagerness to meet new people, to have new experiences, and to kind of get those different perspectives is a common thread among Dartmouth students. And I think something that um, we certainly look for in, in the application process. I'm not gonna talk a ton about the application process. Um, Y'all are bright and well-equipped to Google things, which is uh, the best way to get a lot of the information here. But I will talk about two things that are a little bit different at Dartmouth. 
Um, one thing you'll see where it says recommendations, we do ask for a peer recommendation letter at Dartmouth. Um, we're asking for someone plus or minus five years to write about you, to offer their perspective on who you are outside the classroom. Who are you as a teammate, a stand partner, a cast member, anything. Um, it's a great kind of different perspective in your application. Um, in the same way that we're thinking about who you are in an academic sense, we're also inviting you to live on our campus for four years. So who are you going to be as a roommate? Who are you going to be in the dining hall? What's it going to be like to be on a team with you? Um, we're not asking your peer to write like a novel about you. It can be a page, um, but your friends are going to often brag about you in a way that you never would about yourself. They're really fun to read. They offer a really fun perspective and they are optional, but we really do encourage them because it is a really different um, perspective than anything else we're getting in the application. Um, the other thing that, that is a little bit different at Dartmouth is that we do offer those alumni interviews. Um, those are gonna be conducted virtually again this year. There's nothing that you do in, in order to request that. You don't have to submit a form or anything like that. Just by submitting your application, we pass that information along to our interviewers. It is by uh, product of availability that we're able to offer those. We aren't able to get an interview for every student we'd like to interview. Um, but they're, I think more than anything, a great opportunity for you to pick their brain. Um, ask the alum why they're volunteering for a school that they graduated from 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, how did Dartmouth set them up where they are at this point in their life? What would they have done differently? Um, coming into an interview with uh, questions for them, as many as many questions as they're gonna have for you, makes it so much more conversational. And um, by and large, these are gonna go fine. The interviews that we that we receive and the write-ups that we receive oftentimes add some some liveliness to your application and confirm the rest of the things that are already that we're already seeing in other parts of your application. You see here for all standardized testing for the class of 2022, we are test optional. Um, that is a real life thing. There's a global pandemic still happening. Um, if I have an application and there's no test score, I have plenty of other information. Um, I, I steal a phrase from a former colleague. Testing often matters more than you want, but less than you think. I have never in my 10 years of working in college admissions, like we're into a colleague's office and been like, wow, look at these test scores. Um, they were never the most interesting part of the application. And the best indicator for how hard you're going to work for four years at Dartmouth is how hard you've worked for four years of high school. Um, and the school report, which tells us about your school and your community, the transcript, which tells us the courses you've taken and the grades you've earned in those courses. And then the recommendation letters that we receive that kind of tell the story of, of your transcript and who you are in a classroom. Um, those are always going to be um, more valuable factors for us when we're, we're thinking about all this together. There's a little bit about financial aid here, but I do want to Kind of expound on that a little bit more. Um, we're fortunate at Dartmouth to be need blind for all US citizens, permanent residents and undocumented individuals, meaning um, I don't have to think about it as an admission officer. I don't see a student's ability to pay in any part of the application. Um, but on the flip side of that, we do meet 100% of demonstrated need for all students, regardless of citizenship. So whatever those financial aid forms say is required to make Dartmouth affordable for you and your family, that's what your financial aid package is going to be. Um, this past year, our average financial aid package you can see here was about $62,000 per year of grant money. That's free money. Um, and, and you see there in the middle a full tuition guarantee for families making under $125,000. Um, that's by no means a ceiling, not a floor either. Um, that is just a ballpark idea of the, the aid that we're able to offer. Last year, we got to give out $136 million. It's the best part of my job. I love giving money away. Um, and I think particularly for students from Virginia, it's really helpful to know, um, in addition to the full like net price calculators that every school will have, Dartmouth and about 60 other schools use a calculator that's much faster. It's not as precise as the full net price calculator, but it's only six questions long. Um, and when you have such great in-state options, I think there's an automatic assumption that anything out of state or anything private is going to be more expensive than an in-state option. That could be the case, but start with six questions. It takes like three minutes, you can do it on your phone. And it uses historical information to give you an idea of, of again, in a ballpark range, what a financial aid package at Dartmouth might look like. So it's a great place to kind of get started in the grand scheme of things. Um, I just covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time. And I know we're coming up on time as well. So I wanna kind of give y'all 
um, a place to go to learn more about Dartmouth. Um, I think, you know, a, a silver lining of the last, you know, 18 months has been we have more opportunities to hear from current students at Dartmouth for prospective students than ever before. All of our programming is current student focused. So our information sessions are basically a panel for current students to offer their perspective and ideas. Our uh, campus tours that are happening virtually are real life in real time tours that are taking place. You're asking them questions as they're walking around campus. And we have financial aid sessions that are taking place at least once a month, every month uh, through the rest of this year. Um, and then virtual student chats and community and identity based panels are taking place every week to just ask students questions, ask them about social life, ask them about their transition, ask them about um, really anything. Um, then we kind of have a um, an AP level Dartmouth uh, session, Dartmouth Deeper Dies, where we go a little bit more in depth into what it's like to transition from, say, the mid-Atlantic area, the, the south, to a place where it snows a lot more or a place that's certainly more rural. Um, also an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into the application review process and how we look at applicants. But then we have contact information for all of our students who work in our office on our website. Um, so if you want a specific, you know, perspective of a student who's involved in, I don't know, um, sociology, and you're like, oh, cool, Jack's a, a 24, meaning he's a sophomore. He's from Charlottesville, Virginia. That's kind of, you know, in my, in my neck of the woods. Looks like he's involved in acapella. That's something I've always wanted to do in college. Um, I'm going to shoot him an email. Shoot Jack an email. Um, Dharma students are always really enthusiastic and excited to answer questions, so they're happy to do that as well. My contact information is also on the website with a really ugly headshot, so I'm not going to show you that. Um, but if you have questions, concerns, fun things to say, I read all the applications from Virginia. So um, feel free to find that and reach out as well. But I appreciate y'all's time. I know it's a very, very busy time of year. Um, so every moment is a precious one. All right, now I'm back on. Thank you so much, Eric. That was awesome. I learned a lot that I did not know. I really think it's um, interesting to hear about your six houses. So that that was a pretty different and interesting idea. Does anybody have any questions on the chat at this time? How about extracurriculars, sports? What division are you? Division one. Um, so that's really all the Ivy League is. It's just a sports conference. Uh, we have 32 division one sports, um, everything from, you know, football, basketball, soccer, all the way through to skiing. Um, it's very popular at Dartmouth, probably unsurprisingly. Um, and then of course, below that we have uh, club sports, which still have that competitive aspect. You're still going and competing against other schools. Um, and then intramural sports, which are within Dartmouth, um, I've seen intramural games get just as, if not more competitive than the D1 games sometimes, when you have playing against your friends, for sure. But again, full range there, there's, you know, intramural soccer all the way through to intramural cornhole. So a lot of athletic prowess represented in that spectrum of, uh, of, of athletics and in intramural sports. That's awesome. It sounds like it's a pretty all encompassing campus. Yeah. I especially like to hear about the skiing part. I thought that was a, a nice, a nice added bonus. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, please reach out to Eric if you have any specific individual questions. And um, I hope you have learned some more things. We'll send this video out. We'll have his contact information and um, hopefully you will reach out and ask those questions. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you being on the visit today. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Eric. Have a great week. Take care.